I am pleased to introduce you tonight to our convocation speaker, Dr. Tom Curran. Dr. Curran has a graduate degree from the Gregorian University in Rome and a PhD in systematic theology from Catholic University. Dr. Curran served as the Director of Evangelization 2000 for North America and the Caribbean. He is the radio host of Sound Insight on Sacred Heart Radio and is actively involved in the promotion of classical education and, and fully supportive in living out the Catholic faith. He is a devout Roman Catholic, husband and father of nine children. And like the many families who have sought out Court of Christ Academy, Dr. Curran has graciously supported and promoted the need for this school in the North Idaho community. Thank you for being here, Dr. Tom Curran, and please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, I was sitting uh, here in the front and uh, one of the unnamed faculty named Dory said, <laughs> looking at everyone pouring in, this is so God. And I, that just it gave me shivers. It was like, yes, it just struck such a beautiful truth that God is at work. And so it's only fitting that we begin tonight, in, in any words that I would speak, turning to the Lord and asking his blessing upon this convocation, this incredible opening. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' holy name. We thank you and praise you for the gift of this first Friday, dedicated to your most sacred heart. We come before you humbly asking that you would open your heart to us, welcome us into your heart, and there may we encounter the burning passion of love you have for us. We beg you, Jesus, to shepherd us through this evening. I surrender my lips and the time I have to you and to your glory. I ask, Lord, that those who are here would be encouraged and blessed. Lord, you clear the path. You are the God of fresh starts and new beginnings. So Lord, we honor you tonight and welcome you here in our midst because we do pray in your holy name. We ask that your Holy Spirit would anoint and bless each and all who are here. All of the faculty and staff will be promoting that and speaking that oath of fidelity. Lord, may your hand be on this night to shock us with your generosity. Overwhelm us with your grace. We do call upon our Blessed Mother and her most immaculate heart to be interceding for us as together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What am I doing here? Well, Genevieve, Mrs. Edmond, uh, less than a month ago, was meeting with me about a mile away, having lunch with her and her husband, uh, Cameron, and they invited me to come and, and be the speaker. And this is how she presented it. She said, Tom, we are looking at our convocation to bring in a speaker who is dynamic, insightful, <laughs> humorous, someone who can speak with passion about the mission of classical schools. Unfortunately, he wasn't available, so can you do it? <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> However, this point where I am standing about three and a half years ago has an incredible meaning for me and my family. About three and a half years ago, about a mile that way at a restaurant, my wife Carrie and I met with a couple and we talked about and poured out our hearts about what we were seeing happen to our kids. Blessed with nine children at that time, three of them in high school. And then a couple hours later, about a mile that way, at a place called The Lair, we had another conversation with more people. Some of them are in this room, and you know who you are. And we continue to not only pour out, but to listen 
as these couples began to minister to us about the way in which the heart of Christ was here beating with such glory and abundance, ready to, to bless our family if we would discern and, and consider even the radical step of making a move. And then the next day, about a mile that way, went to Mass. And it was the Lord himself who spoke so sovereignly. Come, I invite you to come. Three and a half years ago, that drive home, we made the decision, we're coming. We're coming here. And our lives have been so fundamentally blessed. The thing that was causing us the, the biggest pain in our hearts were our teenagers. And it was amazing because I'd been doing church work for 30, over 30 years. And I would give talks. I would give these amazing talks on how to raise teens before I had any. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they reached the teen years and I realized, what was I saying? <laughs> delete, 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 right? And it wasn't just that, it was so humbling. You see, parents today, and even more than when this awoken in us five, six years ago, parents today face such incredible challenges to raise their high school age young people in a way that will lead them to flourish in every dimension of their lives and grounding that flourishing in their relationship with Jesus Christ as Catholics. The barriers are enormous, but Lord, I know that you're, you're up to something. Lord, what are you doing? And I remembered a quote from a modern theologian who said, the Holy Spirit responds to the burning questions of an age by raising up saints whose mission lived out provides the answer that that age so desperately seeks. The Holy Spirit responds to the burning questions of an age by raising up saints who have a mission, whose lives are a response to the desperate cry of that age. And so, as I have scanned the horizon in my work in the church, I said, Lord, what is your response? How have you been responding? One of the answers is faith-based classical schools. Not even a question. It's faith-based classical schools that have provided a bulwark, a strength, a hedge of defense against the toxic influences of our time, but also a place where their precious saints and scholars and servant leaders can grow and flourish into godly young men and women. In the past three and a half years, I've been blessed to touch eight different faith-based classical academies, helping them to figure stuff out. How do we grow? How do we advance? How do we move? What do we do? And I have to admit, among the eight, Court of Christ is the very first one where I've ever seen Legos. <laughs> It's impressive. When I saw that for the first time, I'm like, wow, can I go here? This is really cool. <laughs> now, it's not only that these schools are arising, but families are coming. Families are coming. As Carrie and I have told our story on the radio and in person in different places in these past three and a half years, families have sensed the burning concern for doing something for their high schoolers in particular. And I was talking with a the family, they're like, Tom, yeah, I met, I met another family today. Uh, I met at church last Sunday, and, and they said they heard your story, and they, they made it over. And he said, I have to tell you, I've met so many families that have come from the West Side, and I have to say, they are, without question, all of them, fair to Midland. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> They are people of quality. They are people who are intentional. There are people who are saying, I didn't come here for half measures. I came 
to rescue and refresh my family to fulfill their God-given mission. And I really do believe then that in this new school that's emerging, this new academy, this faith-based classical school, God will do amazing things. And parents, if you're wondering, like, are you overstating it, Tom? I'm going to share with you insights taken from St. Thomas Aquinas. Just simple principles drawn from his teachings and show how they have actually impacted my family's life and how they have come to be made manifest in faith-based classical academies. And it's what you can expect here at Court of Christ. So for me personally, I spent about 15 years immersed in a liberal arts education, studying philosophy and theology in, in the arc of my own academic career. And it all culminated in the act of writing a doctoral dissertation. And at that time, I was married, had a couple of young kids, working for the church, having a second job because I worked for the church. And <laughs> at the same time trying to finish my dissertation. And this meant that things in other parts of my life weren't necessarily attended to well, like my yard. And so my yard was a mess. And unfortunately, I lived next to a neighbor whose yard was immaculate. This guy was an incredible tender of his grass and garden and all of this. And so um, one day as I'm typing away my dissertation, I look up and my neighbor who does such a good job taking care of his lawn, went beyond the boundary of our two yards and started to mow my grass. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> He's mowing my yard. So I went out to him and I said, Dean, what are you doing? And he said, Jesus told me to mow your lawn. <laughs> and I said to him, did he mention the laundry? <laughs> no, he said, Tom, I, I, I prayed and the Lord said to me, you need help. I see what you're facing and what you're doing. You need help. I'm here to help. St. Thomas Aquinas says, it is a sign of the nobility of a nature that it requires help from the outside in order to achieve its purpose. Did you hear that? It's a sign of nobility. If the thing that you are attempting, if the one that you are, requires support from the outside, help from the outside, in order to fulfill the particular call. That's why Court of Christ exists. Parents, you might feel a bit overwhelmed by the challenges that you face in your home and outside your home to raise your high schoolers to fulfill their call to be godly saints and scholars and servant leaders. Court of Christ is here to partner with you. And that's what I found. That's been my experience of these classical academies. They've done such a beautiful job of helping, support, encourage, and help parents be accountable to fulfill their call. Now, there's a reason why. St. Thomas Aquinas says that the human being is created by God in such a way that by nature, his goal, his call, is beyond nature. That the call that we have is beyond our own nature. It's supernatural. And as such, it requires God's grace to fulfill. And this is something that is particularly manifest in the high school years. You see, the call that we have as human beings is that we're created for a relationship with God. We're created for union with God. The theological term is kapok state. We're created with this capacity for God in the core of our being, in the heart of our being. And that becomes manifest in high school years in a very poignant, profound way. And so parents, classical academies that are rooted in faith and rooted in our Catholic tradition are meant to be a source of support for you to achieve what Aquinas says is possible for a soul. And he calls it the virtue of magnanimity. 
Isn't that a great virtue? Yeah. It's the virtue of someone who desires to extend themselves to do something great for God. A magnanimous soul is a great soul. I want to give you, I want to give you an example. And it's drawn from one of my sons, John Luke. He's a now a sophomore. He's going into a sophomore year at a classical faith-based school in Spokane Valley. And um, last year he had, he had an assignment. And the assignment was, talk to someone in your life who has pursued the extraordinary. Interview someone who has pursued a great task. And so we talked about it. He said, Dad, I want to interview your brother. My brother Joe was an army ranger, belonged to the 101st Airborne. And he said, can I interview him? Absolutely. So my brother Joe was the, uh, got him on the phone and we started talking and I was listening to this interview. And, and John Luke said, tell me about the program. And he said, how many started? He said, 300. They start with 300 men in this program. And it lasts about 60 days-ish. 300 men started. How many finished? You want to guess? 30. 90% drop out. They don't make it. They quit. They ring the bell. I'm done. 90%. Well, John Luke asked a very natural next question. When did the first one drop out? How long did it take for that first one? And Joe laughed. He said, oh, let me tell you. The first day, they got us up before dawn. They got us out in terrible weather terrible terrain, and they started putting us through our paces. They were relentless. And this went on through the morning. And they said towards just before noon, then all of a sudden the voice started beckoning in the distance. We have a house up here with a warm shower, some hot coffee. We have some food for you. Anyone who wants it, ring the bell and come on up. It's all here for you. And that voice started playing on their minds. And he said it was two o'clock. Two o'clock, the first guy, I'm done. He heard the voice. He was done with the relentless pursuit of this rigorous activity. He went and rang the bell. And he said, at the end of that first day, he wasn't the only one that had dropped out. At the end of that first day, 250 men had quit. Out of the 270 that didn't make it, 250 didn't even make one day. Wow. This call to a great soul, this call to foster a desire to do something great for God, is what your education at Court of Christ, young men and women, is meant to be. You're going to get ranger souls. <laughs> You're going to have an opportunity, and, and I say that, but I want you to know how. I, I've experienced this in my own kids' lives in the last three and a half years, watching four of my kids be in classical faith-based education, two graduate from classical faith-based high schools, and I've watched the relentless pursuit for a magnanimous life. How does that show up? Here's how it should, you'd expect it to show up here. In three dimensions of the soul, in the intellect, in the will, and in the passions. You're going to be invited to pursue what Thomas Aquinas calls the bonum arduum. The bonum arduum. The difficult good. Get used to it. A difficult good is a value, a good, something that is to be realized, but not quickly, not easily, not comfortably, it's going to require patience, perseverance, and sacrifice. This is what happens in classical academies. There's going to be a pursuit of the bonum arduum, in the intellect, in the will, and in the passions. How? Let's talk about the intellect. St. Thomas Aquinas says this. He says that knowledge of the soul is the most obscure knowledge. But when it is known, it is held with the greatest certitude. I want you to hear that again. 
Knowledge of the soul, so that's knowledge of things invisible, knowledge of things divine, knowledge of things supernatural, is the most obscure knowledge. It's not immediately clear. It's hard to get there. But once it's known, it's held with greater certitude than the knowledge that two and two is for. You will have a grounding, a certainty in your mind because you have pursued a difficult good intellectually. And this happens in a distinct way in a classical school in the Catholic tradition. You're going to be exposed to treasures in our tradition. Treasures that are going to wash over your mind, soak into your mind, and they're going to stretch you. Three fruits of a classical education. You're going to learn how to learn. You're going to learn how to think. And you're going to grow in your love of learning. I tested this before I came out here this afternoon. You're going to learn how to learn. I said to one of my daughters, hey, books of the Bible, in order, go. She looked at me and she's like, that's all you got? Stood up, right in order, Genesis to Revelation. I said that, you know, because I can't do it. <laughs> she can, but what do you expect? She learned it in third grade. Whoa. The books of the Bible in order. And then you're going to learn how to think. I said to my other daughter, hey, how many logical fallacies are there? 30. What's number 16? She went, 5, 10, 15. She was ac accessing her memory palace. It's uh, appeal to emotions. What's that? Oh, yeah. But she's in seventh grade. These young men and women, they're going to learn how to learn by accessing their God-given ability to remember. They're gonna learn how to think by giving the rules of the road through a classic methodology that's called logic. And then there's gonna be a passion for learning, a passion. And, and it's, it's a fruit that my wife and I didn't expect. My kids have been part of challenging academic programs in other faith-based schools before we came here. And it has been like the typical experience after dinner in our house is kids are all excited, energetic, happy, and it's like, all right, kids, time to do homework. Oh, I'm tired, I'm tired. You know, it's like complaining and tired, I can't do it. You can only speculate, you probably don't have that in your home, so. <laughs> now, my kids get home, they get around the dinner table together, they take out their books, and they will be there for two hours, three hours, pencil to paper, writing out their homework. What has been instilled in them is a passion for learning that we were not able to do on our own and we didn't see come from the fruits of a standard education that taught subjects. There's something about a classical methodology that will foster the passionate pursuit of learning. You have an opportunity to be a great souled scholar. And I know that there are some of you here that God has gifted in scholarly ways. Access what the Lord is giving to you at Court of Christ. The second is the will. Intellect, will, and passions. So, the will is all about learning self-mastery. Self-mastery is a difficult thing, but you're gonna learn if you give yourself into the spirit and ideals of the Court of Christ Classical Academy. You're gonna discover a truth about life, and it's this. Life is going to be for you either the hard easy, or the easy hard. Those are your choices. Life is going to be the hard easy or the easy hard. 
The hard easy is what? The hard easy is I'm going to give myself over to the hard work, over to that work of doing something great, even though it's difficult. Growing in virtue, Aquinas says virtue is easy. It happens promptly and with joy. They will help forge in you self-mastery so that you'll be willing to face the hard work of growing in virtue. This will also show up in an interior way. So just as a for instance, on the sports field, I know that athletics is going to be a wonderful gift that happens here at Court of Christ. And the self-mastery that is involved in becoming excellent, pursuing greatness in a sport, in a classical setting, is corresponded by the interior work of self-mastery so that you know how to win graciously. You know how to compete with, uh, with the other rather than see them as the enemy, unless it's the Knicks. It's a <laughs> very narrow joke right there. <laughs> but self-mastery, when it comes to the interior life, means this. You can become great and big at athletics without being a great big jerk. You don't have to have a great big ego to get great athletically. And I see this in my kids. When they play sports and they practice, they pray before. When they get to a game, they pray with the other team. At the end of the game, the teams interweave. These, this is a classical uh, faith-based uh, league that my kids are part of. And they interweave and together, those combatants that they were just competing against sing the doxology with the crowd. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. It's so moving to me every time. They just battled and now they sing to the Lord together. Mastering the will. And also the passions. Mastering the passions. This will show up at one level. At one level that will be such a blessing to you. You will fight the battle against the urge towards sin that is called concupiscence. Aquinas talks about concupiscence as the tinder of sin. It's going to spark sin. And I tell you, one of the biggest antidotes to concupiscence is culture. Culture is the atmosphere that is in an environment that unspokenly carries the values and ideals and the way of seeing and living that are in the halls and not just on the walls. A classical academy that is rooted in faith and in the Catholic faith is going to be one that will foster a culture of virtues that will help overcome that urge towards sin. One of the gifts will be you will be protected from situations that so many others that are in high school will face regarding attacks against modesty and purity. The incredible gifts that you'll have because of the environment you're in are hard to overstate today. The last point is that the ultimate urge towards sin is not found in the culture, but the one in whom that culture is rooted. The one whom is the meaning and purpose for all of what we're doing, and that's Jesus Christ and his most sacred heart. It's the heart of Christ that Thomas Aquinas says is encountered in the reading of scripture with faith. What you should expect, hope for, pray for, and seek for these young men and women, these young scholars, these young servant leaders, is that most of all, they would become young saints. Saints because they are in union with Christ crucified, manifested in his most beautiful and sacred heart. Thomas Aquinas, when asked, what must I do to become a saint by one of his brother Dominicans, spoke this famous and brief imperative. What must I do to become a saint? Aquinas said, will it? Will it? The one who understood God's grace so well emphasized in that moment the serious effort of those who pursue him. Having your kids be entrusted to 
Court of Christ is for you young people to know this. Why am I here? You're here because your parents will it. They long for your sanctification, your growth in holiness. The prophet is a gift to us to gain the whole world and lose our soul. A classical education rooted in faith acknowledges the soul, exalts the greatness that is part of the soul, and attempts to pursue that greatness as scholars, as servant leaders, and as saints. Young people, if you do your part, you young saints and scholars and servant leaders, you will be enfleshed here responses of God himself. You will be God's answer to the burning questions of this time. You're not just going to a new school. You're God's answer to the burning questions of our time. One last comment. St. Thomas Aquinas associated magnanimity with another virtue. That virtue is called magnificence. Magnanimity is that one who desires to extend themselves to do something great for God. Magnificence is the one who says, I will accomplish something great through the strength that God has given to me. The strength that God has given to me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Strength is wealth. Wealth. And we steward not only our time, not only our talent, but our treasure. And I do want to encourage you, those of you that are here, I know that you're supportive in many ways already through your prayers, your hard work, through the commitment you have to have your kids come here, and through your giving to make this a financially stable and possible reality. I want to encourage you to pray about the idea that you might be called to do something magnificent for God. That some of the wealth that God has put into your hands, it's all His anyways, just like your life is all His. Some of that wealth has been put into your hands for the sake of Court of Christ. Not only establishing it, not only launching it, but growing it to be everything that God intends it to be. Some families are contributing by bringing their kids here. Other of you will contribute by bringing some of your strength that God has given to you here. If that soaks into you and moves you a bit, you actually will find in your pew a, a card that will allow you to make a donation, to make a contribution. And it's something for you to pray about and think about, and Mrs. Edmund afterwards will be happy to talk with you if you're so moved.